خلاص كملي باش قبل ما تروح لا السيدة ودير كونفرنس وقاعد تدير فيها ها هو هذا اللي بعثها فوني اي ها بدا السيد قاعد يدير في كونفرنس وي كونفرنس سيغ كو باش نبعثوا له الكور جون بينات دوكا راح يركب صح صحيبي Let's go. No. Where is it? Not there. Not there. Not there. Oh, there it is. Okay. There we go. Start in 12 minutes.
Uh, good day, Dr. Sabea. Hello, good day to you. How are you doing? I'm fine, thank you very much. Very good. Yeah, you have consultants show up in the audience, huh? <laughs> good. Well, I guess you don't know who's going to come, right? They just kind of show up. Sure. Okay. Okay, I'll be back, back in about five minutes. Okay. Sure.
Okay, almost ready. Get everybody in here. Greetings, everybody. We're about to start. Let me just get all the panelists in here. Okay, okay. You ready to start? We are ready to start. Yes. Okay, let me introduce you. Let me start the countdown. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Good morning. This is Dr. John Bennett broadcasting from Miami Beach for Neurosurgical TV. We have another Grand Round episode with uh, Abraham Sabea, uh, who's been doing these for a long time. And we're glad he's doing, continues to do them. Uh, rather than introduce everyone from the panel, why don't we go right ahead, Dr. Sabea, to your presentation. Welcome and thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, you're you ready to start? Yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, good afternoon from me and my, my daughter, Asil uh, from Amman, Jordan. Still when having the home confinement, uh, care for you, but not leaving the house at all. Hopefully the things will brighten up uh, shortly. Uh, the topic for uh, this afternoon is abducent nerve schwannoma, which is extremely rare. And I was lucky to get this single case of abducent nerve schwannoma. Remember that only 30 cases around the world have been only reported, 30 cases in the whole of medical literature. Again, I'd like always to show you my beautiful country, Jordan. This is Wadi Ram, where lots of movies have been pictured here. This is moon landscape uh, thing. It's fantastic. Uh, look at the beauty of nature here. The camel caravans. It's called uh, Rosy area, it's Rosy Rocks and Rosy uh, City of Petra is nearby. Lots of adventure tourism. And look at the skies. Again, the camel ride. And then you go to Petra and here you have to go through the slit between two mountains slit which is zigzag, it's about one kilometer in length. You don't see what's at the end of this slit because you keep changing directions. You just see one wall on the right, one wall on the left of, of rose uh, rocks. And then uh, you get uh, out of this slit between the two mountains and you come across this beautiful view of Petra. So this is a top view of Petra to show you that this whole city was carved in rocks as thousands of years ago. And this is the beauty of Petra at night. And one thing everybody says that you cannot see brighter, so many stars like you see in Petra and Wadiram. Look at this, this is a true picture 
at night of how beautiful nature there is. Okay, we'll go to the topic, abuse and nerve. And when we speak about abuse and nerve, we speak about anatomy. So we have to acknowledge the people who actually gave us the knowledge about the anatomy and the surgery uh, of the area uh, that uh, abuse and nerve passes through. Uh, late Professor Rotum, Majid Sami, uh, Lilham Shaker, uh, Takeshi Kawashi, Sam and Mifti, all, as I said, are friends of Jordan and friends of my and my family. I want to single out tonight Professor Vinko Dorans, the director of the International Institute for Neurosurgery and Neuro Research. He is from Ljubljana, Slovenia. And <clears throat> this man, back in 1983, <clears throat> described the Dolan's approach, extradural approach, with the removal of anterior cranial process in his way to the cavernous sinus. Everybody in the world laughed at him. He was the laugh of the, of the medical community. Why should you go to the cavernous sinus? Three years later, he held the first conference about the cavernous sinus and he was recognized as a very wise man. Uh, he wrote four books about the cavernous sinus. Imagine cavernous sinus, four books. And I was lucky that he actually uh, gave me these four books as, as a compliment. And this is his signature. Uh, 25 years later, in 2006, 20 years later, sorry, uh, he held the second meeting about the cavernous sinus, the International Society meeting of cavernous sinus, again in Ljubljana, Slovenia. So this is the International Society of Cavernous Sinus, ISOCS. And in this picture, you can see Professor Donens, uh, and Professor Lindquist, and myself, Takeshi Kawasi, and Tolgul. <coughs> Uh, back in 2014, we established our uh, cadaveric microanatomy laboratory. <clears throat> uh, it was a fantastic piece of uh, performance actually to accomplish this beautiful uh, thing. And this is the opening ceremony at the Grand Auditorium of the University where we held this uh, uh, meeting. And we invited Professor Dolans to be the guest of honor. And he actually opened the, uh, the lab for us. So this is a fantastic lab, 850 square meters with eight stations, each equipped as, a, as if you are operating in your own theater with microscope, drills and everything. And you can see each station is well equipped and established with screens and everything. And we have so many kind of like labs there and this is one of them. And we were held by um, Giants of neurosurgery coming to our lab in Jordan. This is uh, Professor Ali Krisht from Little Rock, Arkansas. And he held this uh, course about how to open the Sylvian fissure, of course, on the heads of cadavers that we brought from the United States. So uh, we have to address these people. We have to accept the, and accept and uh, say that they deserve recognition because they taught us so many things. So let's have a look at the abuse and nerve and overall course. Abuse and nerve comes through uh, brainstem from the pons, actually junction between the pons and the medulla, and it travels up really steep uh, course up and then go here on top of the uh, petrous bone and then to the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus, reaching to the severe orbital fissure going through the annulus of this, and then going into the uh, orbit to supply the single muscle, which is the lateral rectus, annulus of Zen. <coughs> Again, another view showing the distant nerve coming from the sulcus between medulla and pons and traveling its way up, and then lateral to the artery within the cavernous sinus and into the orbit. So here it is, this is the right side, this is this right side, left side. You can see the uh, impression of the trigeminal uh, nerve there, the gazelle and ganglion. And here the uh, abusant nerve passes medial to the trigeminal. So this is the trigeminal forming the impression on the apex of the petrous bone and the 
of distant nerve passes. Let me get to it. Again, beautiful review, beautiful uh, picture from the book of Winko Dolenz. Of course, I read the four books from cover to cover. And every time I read them, I learn something more. Uh, these are, this is the Petrus Karotid, and this is the Foramen Lacerum, and this is the Paracliver part of the carotid, this is the cavernous part. So the distant nerve comes here from the brainstem through the reverse canal, underneath the Gruber ligament, and goes lateral to the, caver the, lateral to the carotid in the cavernous site. And this ligament is the petrolingual ligament, which holds the, caver which holds the carotid artery in the, in the foramen lacerum. Mm -hmm. Again, beautiful illustration from Vinko Dolan's books, Gruber ligament, nerve passing underneath, and the nerve passes in the uh, lateral to the cavernous sinus, lateral to the carotid within the cavernous sinus. So there are segments of the abuse nerve that it comes from the brainstem, the nucleus in the brainstem, the cisternal part, then the venous part, which is the uh, derulus canal, then the cavernous part, then the superior orbital fissure, and then the intracolonial orbital segments. So what's with about six segments? Let's see the origin from the brainstem. That's the origin from the brainstem, the pons. And you can see that this is the nucleus of the abducent nerve. This is the nucleus of the facial nerve. Facial nerve. Uh, uh, Dr. Ibrahim, the voice is very low. OK, we're trying to increase it. Thank you. So uh, this is the, are we there? Uh, yeah, it's fine. Okay it's fine. Yeah, it's fine with me, Doctor Sabay, and it's fine with the internet. I think that now, gentleman... now it's okay. Now okay. it's okay. Okay. Super. Super. So this is the abducent nerve. This is abducent uh, nucleus. This is the facial nucleus. Facial does not go out straight this way. It goes and rotates around the nucleus of the uh, abducent nerve and form what is called as facial colliculus above the stramidalaris in the upper part of or triangle of the fourth ventricle. Of course, these, the three or four nuclei of the trigeminal nerve, the three major sensory nuclei, the spinal, the mesencephalic, the main sensory, and the small motor uh, nucleus. These are superior and inferior salivatory nuclei of the vagus nerve and the vagal triangle here. So again, this is the fiber, this is the facial nerve nucleus, it sends its fiber instead of coming this way, it goes around the nucleus of the sixth nerve and then it comes out. Of course, this is the uh, uh, part of the facial nerve supply. Uh, regarding the abducent nerve, it goes like this here. So, this relationship is very well recognized that the facial nerve sends its fibers around the nucleus of the abducent nerve. And this forms a hump in the floor of the fourth ventricle, and it's called facial colliculus. If you damage that, you damage both the abducent and the facial nerve. While the abducent nerve goes directly like this. As it comes from the front of the brainstem, it comes from the frontolateral aspect, like this. All the nerves are coming out from the anterior lateral aspect of the brainstem, except the one nerve, which is the trochlear nerve, that comes from the back. So this is the trigeminal coming from the anterior lateral surface. And this is the abducent nerve coming from the anterior surface of the pons. And this is the facial and vestibular cut nerve. Could it be that we can get two nerves on the same person on one side? Yes. The duplicated abducent nerve has been recognized. It could be unilateral in five to 28% of cases. Bilateral is less, is one to two percent. So these are two nerves. What about the cisternal segment? As we are in the cistern, cisternal segment here, it's difficult to see the abducent nerve unless, you, unless you use the fiesta technique to follow the nerve uh, along its course. So this is the abducent nerve. Of course, this is the transmural nerve going into Michael's cave. So always the abducent nerve is medial to the trigeminal nerve. Again, this is the abducent here, here. And 
looking in the sagittal again using the fiesta technique you can appreciate this long journey going up that's why it is called <clears throat> fourth sign because any increase in the pressure would cause pull in that nerve and sit nerve is one of the uh, force localizing signs this is a frontal view again this is the brain stem in white the vertebral basilar junction and then the ica the the, the sit nerve going into the drillus canal. So this is the cisternal segment. Again here, cadaveric specimen, basilar artery. This is sick nerve here, sick nerve here, on its way to the drillus canal here. So all this is the cisternal segment. Again here, sick nerve, sick nerve, medial to trigeminal nerve. <clears throat> Same picture here. So this is the clivus, a very small uh, piece of anatomy, but full of very dangerous structures, the brainstem and the neurovascular bundles, etc. So this is the sixth nerve and its way up to the nervous canal. This is trigeminal. This is the facial and uh, the stuvicular bundle. And these are the lower cranial nerves. If you are looking from the back, deep inside, you can see the uh, facial here. And you can see the sick nerve here. Let's come to the venous segment, the Dorellus canal. Again, this is uh, overall view. This is the uh, ducent nerve going into the Dorellus canal. And again, this is the impression of the trigeminal nerve. Just middle to it here goes the uh, Dorellus canal at the fissure between the petrous bone and the clivus, this one where the inferior betrosal sinus runs here and superior betrosal sinus runs there. Again, it goes through a tunnel. The Rillus canal is a tunnel that is covered by dura and it is a tunnel that is made of tube of the dura where the abducent nerve passes and it goes underneath this ligament, the petrosphenoid ligament or Gruber's ligament and then find its way to the lateral wall of the uh, cavernous sinus, lateral to the carotid artery. Can we see the Dorellus canal? Yes. With this special cut, you can see, you can see that. So again, this is look at the back of the clivus with the dura intact. This is the abducent nerve. Now it's entering the Dorellus canal. So the Dorellus canal is here. Here it's entering into the dura canal. It goes like this. Let's just strip part of the dura away. So this here, the dura is intact and the nerve is going this way. Here, this is the nerve going into this venous lake as it were. Look at it here, beautifully this demonstrated. Here, the dura is intact. Here, the nerve is going entry into the Dorellus canal. Here, we are seeing the whole of the Dorellus canal going underneath the uh, petrosphenoid ligament, and then into the lateral to the carotid arch. Trigeminal, facial and vestibular cochlear, and the abducens. And the dorsal canal is here. Same picture. Third nerve, fourth nerve, abducent, trigeminal. So the dorsal canal is six millimeter below and medial to the fifth porous. It is this way, medial and med middle and lower. And it is 13 millimeter medial to the internal detrimators. Internal detrimators should be here. Trigeminal is here, and then you go in. Again here, the trigeminal, the abducent. So we are six millimeter below and medial to the trigeminal porous, to the Michael's cave. Look at this picture here, as the abducent nerve goes through the Dallas Canal. Here we have opened the tube of a dura around the, the nerve, and we can see it passing underneath the sphenu, uh, petrosphenoid ligament or uh, Gruber's ligament. Again here, <clears throat> trigeminal ganglion, the three divisions, V1, V2, V3. Underneath is the Gruber ligament, 
So if you remove the trigeminal, you will come Gruber's ligament like this. If you cut the, the Gruber's ligament or remove it, you will see the Dallas canal. Same picture, abducent nerve through the Dallas canal, underneath the ligament, and then lateral to the uh, carotid arch. So these people should be recognized, should be thought of. They give us this piece of anatomy, Gruber, who discovered the ligament, Dorello, who discovered the canal, uh, Gradingo, who discovered the syndrome. Any lesion in the petrous apex can give you sick nerve function. And Bain, who described all this in his papers. So this is Gradingo syndrome. There is petrocytis at the petrous apex, and the patient would present a sick nerve palsy. What about the cavernous segment? Uh, I refer to this uh, paper, which I published as a resident. I was a very junior resident when I published this paper, when I had my training at the Atkins Memorial Hospital in Wimbledon, London, St. George's Hospital Medical School. Uh, my bosses wanted me to uh, write this paper, and that was really uh, plus for me because that made me interested in the uh, cavernous science. So for me, cavernous science is, is a challenge and I met this challenge, I tried to understand what's going on. So looking at the cavernous sinus and all the triangles, and this is best described in Brinkodolan's book or books, the four books that I've mentioned. So look at this, describing all the triangles of the cavernous sinus. So once you know it, you have unlocked the major secret, the cave of the, of the central sulc, of the central skull base. And then you have conquered the skull uh, as, it, as it were. So knowing what is there in each triangle makes you happy, makes you commanding this piece of difficult anatomy. So again, this is a view from uh, Vinko Dunn's book here, uh, we are on the left side, you remove the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus, like this. This is the lateral wall and you can see the nerves, V1 and the sixth nerve and here the carotid artery. And you can see the Dorellus canal here. And this is the cavernous part. The Dorellus canal and the cavernous part. The gazelle ganglion, V1, V2, V3. And here is the carotid artery covered with these venous plexuses. And the sixth nerve is lateral to the carotid artery underneath V1. And here again, if you remove the anterior clinoid, you can see the distal ring and the proximal ring of the carotid arch. Beautiful uh, information about the anatomy there. So this is V1 here, and the sixth nerve is passing lateral to the cavernous sinus. Coming from the Rose Canal, it's going in the lateral wall, we're on the left side. Uh, so this is sixth nerve, this is V1. This is third nerve. Then it goes into the severe orbital fissure, as, it, as, as in here. We have gone through the severe orbital fissure. So we are looking at the left orbit from, uh, from lateral. So we are looking medial now. This is the left orbit. This is the severe orbital fissure. And this is the lateral rectus. So the sixth nerve would come this way in the medial surface or under surface of the uh, lateral rectus. As it goes through the severe orbital fissure and the annulus of Zen, this is annulus of Zen in white, and red is the origin of the muscles, severe rectus, the vita pelvis superioris, medial rectus, inferior rectus, and lateral rectus. The nerve, sixth nerve, comes within the severe orbital fissure, within the annulus of Zen, in its way to cover, to supply the lateral rectus muscle. The three structures that pass outside the annulus of Zen are the lacrimal nerve, the frontal nerve, and the trochlear nerve. So here we are at the severe orbital fissure, and the sixth nerve is passing into the orbit. Once it is in the orbit like this, this is the uh, lateral rectus, lateral rectus, and the nerve would be in this position. This is lateral rectus, and this is the nerve. Again here, the way it looks when you dissect the orbit.
If you are looking at the orbit from the from above, uh, superior view, this is the roof of the orbit, which is the frontal, the orbital blade of the frontal bone. Remove it, you come across the uh, fascia of the orbit to the orbiter. And through that, you can see the frontal branch of V1. That's the frontal branch of V1 overlying the elevator papillary superioris, which overlies the severe rectus. And this, the left rectus, sixth nerve goes this way. So we know now that we have six segments of the, of the nerve. And if you get an abuse and palsy for one reason or the other, then you have to think of where did this happen, which segment of the nerve, and which pathology. Is it a tumor, is it a trauma, infections, vascular incident, medical causes, as we said, the petrus apicitis of Gardingo, or sometimes it is idiopathic. The topic for today is the schwannoma of the adjacent nerve. So that's where we'll start. It's called schwannoma or a neuroma or a neurolemoma, just the same. It is very, very rare. We all know that the commonest schwannoma is the vestibulo, uh, vestibular schwannomas, because about 90% of these schwannomas. The all the nerves, the rest of the nerves constitute 10%. And this is the sequence. And, uh, the commonest is the trigeminal, lower cranial nerve, Abuse comes very low. As I said, only 30 cases have been reported of abuse and schwannomas, and my case is 31. So they are rare. And the first report we heard about the abuse and nerve schwannoma uh, was reported in uh, 1981 in neurosurgery. And the schwannoma could be following the cisterns. It could be in the cisterns. So we call it cisternal schwannoma as the juicent nerve passed through the cistern. So there you are, cisternal schwannoma, papers, juicent schwannoma, cystic, and the cisternal part from Korea, South Korea, from Czech Republic, abducent nerve schwannoma, mimicking intrinsic brainstem. Look at this. You think this is intrinsic brainstem uh, tumor. It is a tumor of the Sustainable part of the abuse, and, but it's mimicking an intrinsic brainstem tumor. Paper from South Korea also, the sustainable part of the schwannoma. Again, you can easily miss that for a vestibular schwannoma. From Canada, 2009, abuse nerve schwannoma and the sustainable part. Schwannoma, the sixth nerve, review of literature from China, 2015. And from UK, spontaneous hemorrhage into abuse and nerve schwannoma. And this is a new uh, paper that was published in the World of Neurosurgery Journal, 2019, about abuse and nerve schwannoma, cisternal part of the uh, abuse and nerve. Schwannoma can arise from the cisternal part, but going into the cavernous, like this. So it started here and went into the cavernous part. Again, that's following the segments of the uh, abducent nerve here. Cisternal part going into the cavernous part. That's report from India, 2003. Or it could be totally within the cavernous sinus, intracavernous schwannoma. A report of two cases back in 1991 by Dr. Weiss. Again, intercavernous schwannoma within the cavernous sinus. From Japan, 2004, by Takeshi Kawase within the cavernous sinus. From Portugal, schwannoma within the cavernous sinus. Or the schwannoma could be totally in the orbit and this is one schwannoma in the orbit reported in Italy, 2008. This one totally intraconal, intraorbital from Japan, 2016. From India again, 2015, orbital abducent schwannoma. 2012 from Portugal, intraconal, intraorbital abducent uh, nerve schwannoma. From Austria, another case. 
So schwannomas could be in any of the segments that we mentioned for the abducens nerve. As I said, it's very rare. Only 30 cases have been reported. The commonest is the cisternal. 20 cases, cisternal part, five in the cavernous part, and five in the orbital part. And my case is the 31, 31st case reported in literature. In literature, total resection was achieved in less than 50%, and function recovered in only seven cases. This is important. In the schonoma of the abduction, you take it out, they rarely recover. Remember this when I come to my case, we'll discuss it further. So these are the published cases of abduction nerve schonomas, which I mentioned. If you, if you see an image and you think of abduction nerve schonoma, you have to think of differential diagnosis and that would throw you off balance. Look at this. In that part, you can have any kind of schwannomas. Oculomotor schwannoma, trochlear schwannoma, trigeminal schwannoma, which is the commonest, abducent nerve schwannoma. Of course, the commonest of all is the vestibular schwannoma. They are all in the same place. You, I mean, how would you tell that this schwannoma is arising from this nerve? Histologically, it is a schwannoma, but then as a surgeon, you know which nerve it is attached to, what are the fibers they, uh, that give origin to this tumor. So in this case, here you would say this is a schwannoma arising from the trigeminal because I, as a surgeon, have seen that the tumor is arising from the trigeminal nerve. Facial nerve schwannoma, jugular schwannoma, vagal schwannoma, all, all the nerves, accessory schwannoma, hypoglossal schwannoma, a glioma that's going into this area, epidermoid going into this area, chondrosarcoma, chondroma, giant cell tumor, endolymphatic sac, hemangioblastoma, glomus, choroid plexus, partial medulloblastoma, metastasis, choroid plexus, papilloma, cholesterol granuloma, lymphoma, vitroclavar meningioma in that area, arachnoid cyst, DNET, and aneurysm. Aneurysm of the cavernous part of the cavity. So that's what I mentioned last time, that people who are reporting the MRI images should be neuroradiologists. You just cannot have somebody who's reporting on a brain MRI, and then the next five minutes he's reporting on femur X-ray or chest X-ray. It's nonsense. A neuroradiologist should be neuroradiologist reporting only on neuro figures, and you should know anatomy, physiology, pathology, and he should know all the neurosurgical approaches and what are the material used there. Not the flimsy three lines uh, reporting saying ventricular system in the midline, no aneurysms, no AVMs. This is nonsense. So what is the management of these uh, abducent nerve uh, schwannomas? Surgery is the first choice. Some people try radiation. So many approaches for surgery, but as I said, these are only 30 cases reported in literature but depends on the size, the direction you choose your approach. And neuroendoscopy, as I said, is the future of neurosurgery. That has not been, I looked in the literature, I could not find any single paper about the use of endoscopy to remove uh, abuse of nerve. But look at the anatomy that you see in endoscopy. This is the trigeminal nerve. This is vein of dandy. It's a beautiful uh, piece of anatomy that you learn through endoscopy. Radiation treatment could be gamma knife, could be fractionated, uh, other types of, uh, of uh, stereotactic radiotherapy, linear, etc. Some of the uh, literature uh, publications about the use of gamma knife for schwannomas in general, not for in necessarily the acoustic, the abducent nerve schwannoma. Uh, <clears throat> gamma knife radiosurgery in the treatment of abducent. Now I raise a question: How did the man? knew that this is an abducent nerve schwannoma. You can only say that if you are operating, because this could be any of the nerves that are passing there. It could be trochlear, it could be the V1, it could be V2, et cetera, et cetera. So I have a great criticism for this radiotherapy by gamma knife uh, without having histology. And look at the result. This is before the gamma knife and this is seven months after. What is this? And I mean, I mean, how can, you say that this is success. How would you report such a thing? Another paper from Japan, four cases. Again, they say abducent nerve schwannoma. How they, on earth did they know that this is abducent nerve schwannoma? 
by anatomy or any structure there can give you rise to this. It could be anything. It could be actually sarcoidosis, nobody knows. But again, putting this aside, look at the results. This is when they started and this is 24 months later. The lesion is there. It did not disappear. It will not disappear. Radio surgery and trochlear and abducent nerve. How on earth did you, did you know that this is coming from the trochlear and this is coming from abducent without having surgery for that? Unless you do surgery, you would not know. Again, the volumes of the, uh, of the schwannomas or the lesions that they have operated upon is very small. Now we come to the case presentation, abducent nerve schwannoma of today. We will discuss as usual, the clinical, radiological, operative and pathological correlation. <coughs> uh, my daughter, Asil, uh, uh, should have been with me today to, to uh, present the case, but uh, she got some uh, uh, busy assignment in her uh, uh, King Hussein uh, Medical Center. Uh, so this is the uh, the lady for today. This is a 39-year-old 39 female lady from Qatar. And you see me presenting cases from Qatar, from United Arab Emirates. Jordan is a medical hub in the region, and we receive lots of referrals from uh, surrounding Arab countries. Uh, she gave history of two years of occipital headache. And I hear I always stop and say, headache. Headache should be thoroughly investigated. Uh, people speak in our region about the usual normal headaches. There's nothing called usual normal headaches. Headache has a cause. It could be brain tumor. It could be menstrual period. It could be anemia. So look deep into it. And then two months history of numbness where face, tongue, and upper limb. Nobody uh, paid attention to this. And then she got tinnitus and dizziness. And then she got dysphagia. And she had recurrent cough, some voice changes. And that is because of progression of the lesion. Vital signs were normal. A general examination was normal. 15 over 15 Glasgow comma scale. She had lift transhuminal palsy by pinprick, none. And she had lift sixth nerve palsy, and she had lift facial nerve palsy. Let's see that. You can see this is the right eye. This is the left eye. Purple here is a little bit smaller than in here. You can see the eye is deviated inside. So this is sixth nerve palsy. She had also weakness, pyramidal weakness for over five with brisk reflexes and pronator drift. Same thing in her upper and lower limbs. And the planters were uploaded. CBC, bleeding profile, kidney function, electrolytes, liver functions were within normal. Uh, urine analysis showed some YPCs and analyses which were not that significant actually. Images, look at this. This is the prepontine. First it is cerebellopontine and then going into prepontine, pushing the basilar artery to one side. But look at the compression there of the uh, pond. And people would still go and treat this with gamma knife. For goodness sake, this is a brain stem that is compressed to the limit. How on earth one would treat this with radiotherapy of any kind? Look at the amount of pressure on the brain stem. This is with contrast. Not much of the pons is left here. There are some cystic changes. Same thing here. We are in touch with the clivus here, occupying the cerebellum pontine, occupying the prepontine, and this is the basilar. Again, over all of you, starting from below down. Here you are close to the jugular foramen. That's why this lady complained of difficult swallowing and voice changes because you are compressing on the uh, jugular foramen as well as you are compressing on the vestibular cochlear, you are pressing on the sixth nerve and then on the trigeminal nerve. This is the internal detrimators here. Cochlean, semicircular canals, and the basilar being pushed. Coronal view, 
showing you the tremendous amount of pressure on both the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla. Again, how on earth somebody in his own mind would treat this with radiation with this amount of compression there? You need six months for the gamma knife or for radiation to start. Three months for the conventional radiation, six months for the gamma knife to it to start giving you some results. The start of results is this period, three to six months. How would you leave brainstem like this under pressure for six months? That really uh, defeats me. Again, look at the pressure here. Pons, pons, medulla, and midbrain. Sagittary view. We are in the prepontine system, completely obliterating that, pushing the brainstem backwards. Again, the cystic degeneration within the tumor. This is CT scan showing this you this low density. Are no changes in the internal determinators. So you say, well, this most likely is not a vestibular schwannoma, but again, this is not necessarily so. Some vestibular schwannoma, they don't cause the changes within the internal determinators. But so far, as you don't see it, it is most likely not a vestibular schwannoma. Look at the shift of the basal artery. The tumor is here, pushing the the tubular basal, basal in particular to the right side. Why am I mentioning this? Because we are going to see this in her operative video. And this is the venogram, which is part and parcel of this kind of surgery. You have to know every bit of details about the venous system. Venous system forgotten by neurosurgical residents and lots and lots of the neurosurgeons, as if it does not exist. It, this is not important. And it, their pain. So just sacrifice it. No, you can kill the patient. You can cause major neurological deficit by ignoring the importance of the venous anatomy. Here. In this particular case, look at this occipital sinus. If you are not aware of this, you would kill the patient on table. So this is the overall view. Tumor is a prepontine as well as in the cerebellopontine, pushing the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla with some cystic degeneration and the vertebral push from left to right. We did a few consultations because of the uh, cough and so on. We asked uh, the pulmonologist, Dr. Khaled Masad, to see her. And he said, well, her lungs are OK, but the cough is secondary to the liquid dysphagia that she's having. Also, we asked Dr. Mahmoud Al-Assad, the ENT surgeon, to uh, do the investigations for her, including tympanometry and others. And laryngoscope, and he says, well, she has some dysphagia, but her vocal cords are intact. And the reported mobile soft palate and normal audiometry bilaterally, with absent left cervical reflex, to explain his tinnitus. Anesthesia was declared as fit for general anesthesia, American Society of Anesthesia, class four. I use the sitting position in this case. It's a favorite position that I um, um, I like it and I have done it so many times and my anesthetist uh, always, we are making one team, we understand each other, we understand each other needs and uh, we make a point that the feet should be a deliver of the heart. So this is the normal position and the, the prone position. And this is when you do the uh, sitting position, you can flex the head and you can open the frame and regimen like this. Sitting position, and we cover the table, and the anesthetist can sneak underneath this cover and check on his tubes and check on everything here. So there is an access to the face of the patient, to the tubes, to everything. And what we do is to put an electricity bulb underneath this so that this would give heat, and this way the patient would not lose uh, body temperature. We use the uh, monitoring of the cranial nerves. This is the uh, latest microscope. And this is the sitting position. You are your rest your arms. People say, well, in sitting position, your arms would ache. I, I don't have this problem. I don't have any cervical problem due to the excessive use of the sitting position because it's a beautiful 
position where you see the anatomy, it, there's no change in the anatomy where the blood and CSF would flow down. You don't even need an assistance. And as I said, there's monitoring. We can use the navigation. Again, I learned from Professor Kezarjil that your navigation is your brain, but because the navigation is there, you can use it. You can challenge your residents. What is this? What is this? And so on. It gives them confidence. And if you differ with the machine, then your opinion goes. So this is the position. So when you want to reach to the cerebellum and tan angle, uh, like this here, this is the ideal way to go into the facial. This is the ideal way to go above to the trigeminal. And this is the ideal way to go to the lower cranial nerves. So this is the incision of the dura. So you come here when you reflect the dura to this surface, which is the occipital surface of the cerebellum. This is the tenterial surface of the cerebellum towards the tent. And this is the petrous surface towards the petrous bone. A constant form has been taken, extensively written. It is tailored to the patient's condition. There's no general consent form uh, in neurosurgery, it cannot be. Each patient is different from the other and you have to discuss uh, this. In this particular constant form, I men mentioned to the patient and her husband that the complication here is 10 to 30%. And I explained that and I say that one of these complications is loss of life. So this is a major surgery to be taken and it should be taken only by the experienced people not by the novices. Let's see the surgery. <clears throat> so here we are. We are actually uh, going, here is the, oops, working between the facial and the trigeminal. Remember this is sitting position. The right side is here. Excuse me, doctor, your, your slide's not showing. We it's cannot showing. see your video, sir. Okay. We'll, yeah. we'll do that again. It's okay, no problem. Take your time. Okay, yes. we can see it. Okay. As I said, you operate between the cranial nerves. This is the facial, and this is the trigeminal. This is the tent here. So I'm dissecting the arachnoid, and here is the tumor. This is the abducent nerve. It is attached to the tumor. Tumor is not attached to the facial nerve, it is not attached to the trigeminal nerve. So I know this is an abducent nerve schwannoma. Trigeminal with vein of dandy, having the bulk tumor from inside, I'm taking the arachnoid. I always take the arachnoid towards the brainstem. This is here starting to see the basilar artery. Trigeminal here with the vein of dandy. So trigeminal, facial. You are working between cranial nerves and then you work between the facial and the lower cranial nerves. So now we are cutting a piece of the tumor. The principle is general, debulk, dissect, debulk, dissect until you finish it off. Again, you are not going in this dangerous part of anatomy, dangerous part of the body to take a biopsy and then send for radiotherapy. This is the criminology at its best. I don't subscribe to this kind of uh, crimes. So you can see trigeminal is free in the facial now. But again, as we are going in, we are touching the facial. And here is the value of the uh, cranial nerves monitoring. You still follow the uh, noise of that efficient nerve is still intact. Once you lose it, uh, that's bad. But all through, we got the signal from the facial nerve. Again, here you can see the arachnoid. We are taking the tumor off the pons. We are here seeing the surface of the pons. Now we are working between the facial and the lower cranial nerves. You debug. And then you find the space and then you go around the tumor. Again, the tumor is not arising from the facial, so it is not a facial. Look at this. 
This is the abducent nerve. Fibers are giving rise to the tumor. So this is abducent nerve channel. I'm trying now to separate the, the abducent nerve from the capsule of the tumor. I always take the arachnoid towards the vital structure that you need to, to, to preserve, to preserve its blood supply. So this is the nerve. That's where the Dorellus canal, this is the entry into the Dorellus canal. That's why the pieces of anatomy that we mentioned are relevant. This is the nerve, it's coming from the brainstem like this, and then pushed and then going into the Dorellus canal. My duty is to separate both and preserve it. But this manipulation has a price. I know when I'm doing this, now the patient may come out with abducent nerve palsy, complete. I know when I'm touching the facial nerve that they can come with facial palsy. But if you keep the anatomy intact, then you know the function would follow. But so far, the signal from facial nerve is there. And we have to see about the abducent nerve later. This is abducent at the lower pole of the tumor. You separate it from the tumor itself. This is delicacy kind of surgery. Yeah, either you enjoy it or you don't. I enjoy what I'm doing. Mm. Uh, hey. And, and uh, as I said, it is not for the novices. It's here is arachnoid. You cut that arachnoid so that you free the tumor completely. I'm using my left hand and I always teach my residents that you have to be ambidextrous. You have to use both hands for the same efficacy. So here's the tumor. And this is the abducent nerve going into the renal canal. You can see it. This is some of the arachnoid. This is the basilar artery here and then the pons itself. Here I'm trying a plane of cleavage between the tumor and the pons. And you can see shortly, you will see the white stuff of the pons, which is this. This is the anterolateral surface of the pons. And I'm separating the tumor of that part. Using the ultrasonic aspirator would help. Ultrasonic aspirator would suck anything in, 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 in its way, putting, put, putting it on the cranial nerves that will suck it. So it is you who are in control, not the machine. Again, here you can see the basilar artery quite clear. This is the lateral surface of the pons, it's trigeminal, and here is the fascia. So we are working between the cranial nerves, facial lower cranial nerve, facial trigeminal, trigeminal intent, and you can see here the trochlear nerve. So this is the last piece of the tumor attached to the arachnoid, as you can see here. Again, some say, leave it. No, don't leave it because it will give the... So this is the basil, and this is the promontory here. Trigeminal with the vein of dandy, facial nerve, with the, with the vestibulococcular bundle, and lower down, this is the basilar, as you can see. This is the abducent, this way. This is basilar, trigeminal. So trigeminal is there, facial is there, and these are the lower cranial nerves. So if you have preserved them, this is a benign tumor, you have done justice for the patient by doing the surgery. This is the abducent nerve. Okay. So, histopathology reported by our histopathologist, Dr. Hassan Abdelhasek, who's a fellow of the American College of Pathologists. And he reported the classical appearance of a schwannoma with some Antony A, Antony B areas, etc. These are the slides. 
And using the immunohistochemistry, S100 was positive, lamentin was positive, which is classical for schwannomas. EMA negative, again, it is, it is not a glial tumor, so it is negative. And KI67 was less than 1%. So this is a benign tumor, a difficult situation that has been removed of the patient. So the final result is schwannoma, no malignancy is seen by Dr. Abu Farsar. For suboperative course, patient was awake on table before we sent her to the ICU. If she's not awake, then something's wrong. We have to know it. She cannot be put on a ventilator. No one should be putting patient post-operative on a ventilator. This is a crime in my mind and the mind of anybody who knows the neurosurgical practice. Post-operative MRI means the following day. Finishing mid, mid, midnight or 11 p.m. the following day, six hours later, you do your MRI. If you don't, then you are hiding something. If you do CT scan, you are hiding something. You started with doing preoperative MRI. So why on earth would you do postoperative CT scan? You are hiding something. Do the postoperative MRI immediately. So this is it. Immediate postoperative MRI with contrast. No complications, no tumor left, no residue of the tumor. And this is the patient, immediate post-op. As we expected, total complete signal quality. Right side, left side, you can see it is going in. And if we want, if she looks to that side, to the left side, then this does not move. This is total signal pulsing. Now, patient and her family would be worried, but because you have explained to them that touching these cranial nerves would result in their impairment, and this impairment is usually temporary if you have kept the anatomical structure of the nerve intact. So I assured her and her family, especially her husband, that she is going to improve. Still, when she went out of the hospital and came for suture removal, still the sixth nerve is there. And there is some pressure. Look at this squeeze of the eye here. It's not squeezing well here. It's not closed. So there is an element of second nerve pulse. Discharge with the detailed discharge summary, which, which we, are, we are used to. Everything and anything that happened to the patient is mentioned in full details. Follow her three months later. No residue, no complications. Coronal view. Surgical views. And this is the patient. Now, facial approved. So, as expected, within three to six months, they improved. Two years later, no residual tumor whatsoever, no complications. Six years later, no tumor, no radiation, no misery of radiation. Radiation is something you use as a palliative to treat patients when they are in need, but to use it upfront for anything and everything because you are a mediocre surgeon. This is what I'm fighting against all my life. Radiation is useful, but it should be used in the proper place. So this patient did not have any radiation whatsoever. And this is a benign tumor that has been removed. And look at her stages. This is before surgery. This is immediate after surgery, total sick nerve. This is when she came to the clinic after about two weeks, still sick nerve, we are starting to improve, and then it's improved completely. With this, I finish, and many thanks to my team, many thanks to uh, Farah Hospital Foundation, late Dr. Zaid Kilani, my assistants, my secretaries, the anesthesia team, uh, it's as if in the radiology team, the nurses, everybody, the lab, uh, it, is, it is a group of people working together. It's not one man show. With this, I finish and I thank you. Okay, Dr. Tavaya, thank you very much. Another excellent presentation. Uh, you've been doing this for a long time. I'm glad you got into the internet.
Okay, now as far as uh, we want to open for questions, but let me just try to explain it so it's most effectively used. If you have a good internet connection, you can come in and ask Dr. Savea a question with your screen, with the main, uh, as a panelist. However, if you have a weak internet connection, uh, you can text the question in the text box. Okay, with that, I'll open it up. Someone step forward. Come on, you guys. Well, first of all, I would like to thank Professor Ibrahim Tabe. Uh, excellent presentation once again, like always. Thank he and thanks, John, for giving us this opportunity to, to learn from the giants of neurosurgery directly, like Dr. Professor Ibrahim Tabe. Thanks a lot, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. You guys are lucky. You guys are very lucky to live in this age. I think, Dr. Sabaya. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah definitely. People in training, uh, to me, the internet's a big advantage. So more, more comments and questions, please. Hello? Yes, go ahead. Hey, Dr. Weil. <laughs> I hello. just want to, yeah, I want to say hello to my uh, mentor, Prof. Sabaya, in this hard time of uh, Corona. Yeah, he inspired me and he's a wonderful friend and mentor and father. Uh, I would like to say to him, please accept my appreciation for your support, your mentorship, and thank you for changing my life. Uh, thank you, Prof. Thank, thank you for your thank comments. You. Thank you, Dr. Okay, more comments and questions? Yeah, we'll get better at this using this platform, people aren't really accustomed to it, and it's new. Uh, some, some sessions we have are very interactive. Uh, it's just learning it. I think it'll, everyone will get better. Okay, go ahead, whoever, Sammy, go ahead. Yeah, hi, I'm Sammy Khatib from Jordan. Just to say what uh, my friend always saying, a fool with a tool is still a fool. So I'm, I'm meaning uh, regarding radiotherapy, that if we are going to use it before surgery, never we can know what's the type of the tumor and it's uh, totally contraindicated. Thank you, Sami. Sami Khatib is a radiation oncologist and to have these words from a radiation oncologist saying that we really need histology before we give radiation. We really need to reduce the tumor to zero or to little bit of a tumor left to give radiation. But to give radiation for a pathology that we don't know and with the huge volumes of a tumor, uh, this should be stopped. Well, you know, that may be a good talk for Sammy to give. <laughs> well, <yeah. laughs> Dr. Okay, Speer? Go ahead, go ahead. Hi, I'm Dr. Ibrahim Asidat. Yes, welcome. Uh, I have two comments. Uh, actually, the first comment is the uh, importance of a neuroimaging in uh, isolated cranial nerve pulses, because some yes. uh, doctors will not do neuroimaging in a simple six nerve pulse in an old uh, patient, because most of the time it is uh, uh, medical or microvascular cause. Uh, so this is one issue. The other issue is uh, that uh, you had, uh, you did a great job uh, by restoring the function of the sixth nerve, but even if the function was not restored, uh, I mean, we can do uh, a transposition surgery for the muscles and yes. after uh, six to nine months of waiting, we can go and uh, correct the patient's alignment. And most of the time, they are straight again. Thank yeah, you. Dr. Brahim Sadat is an ophthalmologist uh, surgeon. Uh, we cooperate a lot and uh, he and I share the same views uh, that young patients, even, even in an old patients, don't think of the cerebrovascular incident to explain the abducent nerve palsy. If you have an abducent nerve palsy, especially in a young adult, please go and do MRI and not CT scan, MRI. CT scan is useful for trauma. It's not useful anymore for the follow-up of patients. And uh, waiting on things uh, because of money is, is nonsense. We have a question from Darius. 
Thanks a lot for your presentation. When would you consider gamma radiotherapy? I would never consider gamma radiation, or for that matter, as an upfront way of doing things. I believe that surgery is the first line in treating these lesions. But if the case recurred, if you could not remove it because the basilar artery was really attached to the tumor and so on and so forth, then you can give gamma. And when you reduce the, the, the tumor volume into a very small volume, then you can always wait. It's not necessarily that you follow the surgery by radiation. Just taking 90% of the tumor out, follow them up sometimes for many cases, the tumor volume will remain the same and you don't need to do anything. Gamma knife is useful. I had my training for six months at Karolinska Institute, which is a very huge institute, very high caliber. And I learned from them. They are the, the, the makers of this machine. Uh, they have invented this machine and they are very careful about how to use it. They have a committee to choose patients, not as, as any patient, as any complaint, they just use the gamma knife. So you need a committee to control when to use the gamma knife. And that's the beauty of training at Karolinska Institute in Sweden. Okay, more comments, questions? Hello. Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead, Hamza. Good evening, Tolspeh. Hello. Hello, good evening. Uh, do you hear me? Uh, hello? Yes, yes, I hear you well. Yes, we hear you. Hello, everybody. Thank you for such a presentation. My question is, if there is a major extension uh, for uh, into the cavernous sinus for such a tumor, yeah. would you change your mind about the surgical approach? Is it a, a two-stages approach or one-stage approach? Yeah, sure. Now, I believe that in most cases, by just doing the simple retrograde, retro-sigmoid approach, you can reach to that part. So if the major part of the tumor is in the posterior fossa and the smaller part in the cavernous sinus, I assure you by doing the retrosigmoid approach, you can reach it. Even if you need to slit open the, uh, the tentorium. Uh, I learned something from Professor Albert Rotten. Uh, he's a migrate mentor. And he said, who in his own mind want to go into the cavernous sinus? We go there because the tumor takes us there. The tumor extends itself into the cavernous sinus, so you go into the cavernous sinus. So we have to learn, we have to learn how to operate within the cavernous sinus if the tumor is going there. So I would not change my approach if the major part of the tumor is in the posterior fossa. But if the tumor, like one of the cases I showed is really a huge dumbbell, one part of it is in the cavernous, part of it in the posterior fossa, then yes, I would use the Kawasi approach for the part in the cavernous sinus and the retrosigmoid for the posterior fossa part. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay, more questions? Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Ibrahim. Go ahead. Alaikum salam. Dr. Abdullah Zidan, Maak, Kalmak, Saudi. Hello. Uh, I'm Dr. Zidan from uh, Saudi Arabia. Welcome. Uh, actually, I'm uh, I'm. Uh, I'm considering myself a small friend of Dr. Ibrahim, and I'm fond of his surgeries and of his uh, of his uh, lectures. Uh, it's not the first time, and uh, I hope things will uh, continue between us. And I'm really thankful to these days that we can really see his work through these webinars. Uh, I have to thank Dr. Ibrahim for his elaborative uh, academic didactic uh, lecture, which started by uh, anatomy from all its uh, way from the brainstem, uh, I mean, starting from the nuclei up to the, to the end of the, to the muscle itself. Uh, it's really beautiful thing. Uh, the side of surgery also was amazing and nice, like Dr. Ibrahim is always showing us. Uh, actually, uh, uh, I'm, I'm not the one to, to, give, uh, to give a certificate to Dr. Ibrahim. He's well known for all of us and uh, we are all proud of him. Uh, from all aspects in the Middle East and the Arab world and even on the internationally. Anyway, I had just a small comment or question, Dr. Ibrahim. Please. Uh, uh, I mean, concerning these, uh, I, I'm, I'm calling it a little bit difficult approaches, which needs uh, real training, real, uh, real hands-on uh, work for all of, even us and uh, young people, 
uh, you had started before some uh, cadaveric uh, uh, courses or workshops and then that was stopped years back. Uh, so what are your plans for this now? I have no comments on your case. I mean, your case is excellent. I have no comments on it. But... Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Abdullah Zidane is a neurosurgeon from Saudi Arabia, and I'm proud that we are friends. Uh, as I said, and I have showed that we have established this cadaveric lab, but uh, for the last year or so, it has stopped for some financial uh, reasons, not for any other reason. But hopefully we can resume the activities again, because uh, to me, it's a good advantage plus to this area for training of young neurosurgeons and residents and young neurosurgeons on cadaveric courses. To have somebody like Lynn Cordellens taking you through the cadaveric sinus, Alec Rich to take you through Sylvian Fisher and then there clipping and so on and so forth on heads on cadavers brought from the USA is something that we are proud of. And I think this is the contemporary way of teaching residents. You cannot take the resident on a patient and teach him. He should learn it from the cadaveric lab. And then when he masters that, and the cadaveric lab you take him. I'm not ashamed to say that I attended the courses of Professor Ruto many times when I was a neurosurgeon, even when I got my certificate, I was full-fledged neurosurgeon. When I went many times to his lab to learn, because this is the only way to do things. But to have your certificate as a neurosurgeon and then say slum at home doing nothing, this is not good. So we have to encourage our young residents, young neurosurgeons to go for these cadaveric labs and they are everywhere. I totally agree with you. I'll be your first student in the coming workshop. Huh? Thank you. Okay, more comments, questions? Hello. Go ahead. Um, uh, thank you, Dr. Sabeh, uh, for this uh, nice presentation. I'm Dr. Rania Subira from uh, Sudan. I'm third year uh, surgical resident. Well, surgical resident. Uh, thank you so much for this well prepared and well informative presentation. Uh, as usual, and uh, we all admire you in Sudan. Uh, in fact, uh, we heard about you a lot from our seniors and from our misters. Uh, and uh, as uh, our, my senior and uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Wail said, uh, um, you are well respected here. And uh, in fact, we keep saying to, to Mr. Wail, uh, Wail Sabeh, because he keep telling us more stories about you every now and then. So, uh, and I met you uh, in a conference like uh, four uh, or three years ago, and uh, it was uh, really uh, profound presentations, uh, what you gave us there. And we kept reciting your uh, comments uh, over and over, like uh, the, uh, you, sh you shouldn't put your uh, lack of uh, skills and lack of knowledge over the patient and say that this is not operable or this is, uh, uh, not, uh, I, I can, uh, or this is not a uh, reachable tumor. And uh, the well-known uh, uh, quote, uh, as uh, one of our uh, Mr. said here in this presentation, a gamma knife is a stupid tool in a hand of fool. So you have to, you, you shouldn't um, uh, put it as a first line. Um, uh, my comment, uh, I really want to highlight a, a nice uh, point in the presentation that the order of the complaint of this patient tells us about uh, the location of uh, the schwannoma. So uh, what a profound uh, presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. And I'm proud uh, to hear these comments from all the Sudanese doctors. I have great relationship with the young generations and the old generation. Uh, and I'm proud of this kind of relationship. We had so many uh, uh, Sudanese doctors coming for training with us. Uh, we are happy to train more, and it is, I believe that we have to disseminate the neurosurgical knowledge. When we die, we take the information uh, well, that we have to the grave. We shouldn't. We should disseminate this. We should send it to everybody to make the humankind better, to get a better treatment for, for our patients. So thank you for your comments. And uh, the point you mentioned is very valid. There are two questions you ask yourself always. Where is the lesion and what is the lesion? What is the lesion meaning that, is it in the cortex, is it in the brainstem, frontal lobe, spinal cord, whatsoever? And once you define where is the, uh, the location of the tumor, then you start thinking of the pathology and you start thinking of it this way in a very orderly manner. Is this a congenital um, problem or acquired problem? And if it is acquired, is it inflammatory? Is it vascular? It is neoplastic, it is so on, so on, so on. 
So if you answer these questions, you would be a better uh, person. Uh, surgery on its own is not enough. You have to be a good clinician, good diagnostician, good surgeon, good researcher, and so on. All this put together makes a good in your research. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, more comments, questions? And, uh, sorry, and Go we ahead. wish to see you in, uh, in the future conferences here in Sudan as well. Hopefully so. After Corona, hopefully we will get Yes, it. yes, yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, and we can always connect this way too. Um, yes, sure. Uh, yes, yeah, interactivity, uh, Dr. Sabea. I'm glad these kids get a chance to interact with you, uh, you know, and get to meet you. Uh, so sure. it's, it's a great thing. Okay, uh, any more comments? Uh, okay, okay. Well, Dr. Sabea, we'll wrap it up. And uh, what, do you have a topic for next week yet? Uh, uh, next Wednesday, the same time, six o'clock, I'm going to speak about pineal locus tubes. Okay. Pineal gland tubes. Very uh, we good. have a few many cases there, and we have lots of pathology there, and beautiful anatomy. So it's going to be interesting lecture. Okay, very good. Thanks to all the panelists for coming. Thanks, of course, Dr. Sabea. And uh, we'll see you on Wednesday at least, maybe before. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.